All right, good morning, everybody. My name is John Kendall. I am the topic for the day is risk informed design. So, you now this is a site characterization workshop. Of course, site characterization is going to play a huge role in our risk characterization and, of course, a role in our risk informed decision making approach. So, certainly, this topic seems to fit in, although it's a little bit unique, maybe from some of the other topics that we've talked about today. Um, so, my objective is for the day. Explore the differences between risk-informed decision-making and risk-informed design. Uh, so those not necessarily completely separable elements, but um, you know, there, there's definitely some differences to using risk to inform a decision to take action and to spend money, make an investment versus using risk to actually store some of our standards and code-based design to, to do things a little bit differently because the risk says that's the right answer. So we're going we're gonna to talk about those. We're going to review the definition of risk. You'll probably already heard that this week. You're going to hear it again. I'll try to be quick, but hopefully it serves as uh, another take on it and another review of that. Hopefully some of it sticks. And then we're going to review the guidance. I do not want to shove guidance down your face for 45 minutes, so I'm going to Flow through that quick, but I do want to know every, you know everybody to be able to find this information and read the guidance themselves. So we will spend a couple slides on that. And then mostly we're going to go through a series of case studies, um, some work that my cadre has done and show how we've taken the risk and the risk characterization to inform our decisions to take action in some cases or not take action. And, and then even more so going to that next step where we've actually gone to a risk-based design and made a risk-informed decision to ignore existing guidance and, and, and tweak that and, and maybe do a little more, or do a little less, to, depending on what the risk is telling us. All right, so starting with the guidance, first one is ER 11102-1156. So certainly anybody working in the dam safety program should be familiar with this guidance. I should have read it. It's not short, but it is important. This, this guidance when it came out, this regulation when it came out, was really the first step of transitioning USACE from you know, really just a complete standards-based approach to managing dam safety to move into a risk-informed approach. So we know what risk is. We're going to review it in a minute, um, kind of show how that, that, that change occurred and what it does. There's also another piece of guidance to be familiar with, the EC uh, 1165-2-218. This is the guidance for the levy safety program. I uh, believe this is still draft at the time of this recording. It's being shared right now with local non-federal sponsors uh, to get feedback and to kind of socialize that program as it's coming out. But it's going to do the same thing as 1156 in a lot of ways, and it's transitioning us to a risk-informed approach to, to the levy safety program as well. So there's a lot in common between those two. Third one I want to talk about, and the newest one, is this ECB 2019-15. So this covers both dam and levy safety programs, and it provides guidance for incorporating, incorporating risk-informed design across all phases of work, dams and levies. So, so what does that mean? Um, this guidance walks through, uh, I, I put A through E here in the bullet points, but um, principles one, hold life safety paramount. That you're gonna read that through, through both the levy and the dam guidance that we just previously mentioned. A risk-informed approach will be used for all dam and levy designs for new projects, modifications, improvement, rehabilitations, or repairs. So it really kind of closes the gap, at least in 1156, for, for how we're going to treat new projects. Um, and this is telling us that, yeah, we're going to use a risk-informed approach across all phases of work. So if we're building a new project, we're going to have risk assessment. Risk is going to inform what we're doing there. It's not just going to be a complete standards-based uh, and code-based approach anymore. Um, the other one on here that I want to point out is learn and adapt, uh, letter D here. Risk assessments will be used to evaluate if designs must be upscaled or downscaled. So that's really the first time we're seeing that, that door really wide open for what we're going to call risk-based design. So we've looked at uh, traditional design standards, and in some cases, when we look at it from a risk, uh, risk assessment approach, we find that even with traditional design standards, we're, we're, we're still going to have intolerable risk. Risk is going to be too high. And so we, we should ignore those. We should, we should do more. We should do better. Um, we also have the uh, approach here of downscaling. So in some cases, 
we've got a dam or a levee that just protects, you know, farmland, and there's no life safety risk necessarily associated with it, maybe we shouldn't be treating that to the same design standard uh, that we would for a traditional dam or levee that's around a city or, or a more developed area where we could have life loss. So that's really opening that door for what we're going to call risk-based or risk-informed design. Um, so in summary, uh, said some of these words already, standards-based design. That's our traditional code-based design. Geotech, you're looking at factors of safety. If you're a structural engineer, you're probably looking at LRFD and, and load and resistant factor design. And, and those are, that's a traditional way we design, right? And those are in some way based on risk. And people, you know, cities have come up with these factors of safety or there's been um, a lot of testing and statistics done on steel to determine what, you know, strength reduction factors should go into that. So th these things are built into our normal engineering world. And so we use these standards. We don't repeat that type of analysis on every project. We go to our data design standard. Somebody's already done that work for us and we use that to, to develop a, a safe design. Um, moving from that, we've got this uh, risk-informed decision-making. So that's a decision to take action or not take action or to address certain failure modes or not certain failure modes based on risk. But step one, we're, we're still gonna fall back to that standards-based design. So risk said, yeah, we need to do something. We need to make that investment um, to, to buy that risk down, but we're still gonna take a standards-based approach. Um, in both, both the levy and the engineering or the, the, the dams guidance, you're gonna see a concept called as low as reasonably practicable. That's kind of the first step that you see to that, that risk-informed design approach, right? So as low as reasonably practicable, ALARP, you know, what does that mean? That, that means we've decided that risk is intolerable and we're gonna make an investment in, in, in buying that risk down one way or another, um, but how low? How low should we be targeting? How much investment should we make? And that's a judgment call uh, based on what options are available to us, the cost of those options, how much risk reduction we're gonna get for them. So, you do see this ALR principle and the other guidance. And then we've got this straight risk-based design. And that's kind of already hit on it. In some cases, we may choose to ignore some minimum design standard because risk is too high, too low. Um, that, that kind of couples in with that, that ALR principle. How low is how low is low enough? Um, so we're going to talk to those through some design examples, starting with a review of risk. So in the core of engineers, we define it with this equation up above. It's got three elements. Number one, probability of loading. That's the probability of having some hazard. That could be a flood load, seismic load, wind load, ice load. You know, what, what is the probability that this event occurs? So I know in my life, working in the design field, both private sector and with the core, there's always the, uh, the engineer that wants to play the, the what if game. You know, what if we have this major flood? What if what if we have a PMF and a wind event at the same time and a seismic event at the same time? Um, that, that's part of what we're doing here is answering that question. We're answering that by looking at the probability of those events occurring. So the, the first part of this incremental risk equation is going to be that probability of that hazard occurring. It's an annual probability of, of that load really it's a it's an exceedance probability probability that load is exceeded in any given year uh, the next element is performance or, or the probability of failure we call that the system response probability of the dam or of the levy so given that that load occurs what's the probability that it fails if we have a very very low probability of failure given that hazard occurs who cares right our, our risk would be low and so we're going to look at the probability of loading and then the probability of failure given that load. And those two terms are gonna be the annual probability of failure. Um, couple that with consequences, what happens if it fails, how many people would die, what kind of economic damages would we have, what kind of environmental impact would we have, et cetera. We bring in those incremental consequences. Uh, now we've got this term risk when, when we take the product. Um, so when we look at those, we, we use the standard FN chart on the vertical axis is gonna be the annual probability of failure. Uh, so starting at the top, um, 
one in 10, one in 100, one in 1,000, one in 10,000, one in a million. So as we go down this chart, we're getting lower and lower annual probability of failure. So we're getting a more robust design, less likely to fail. And then we're going to plot separately those incremental life loss consequences. This is also an order of magnitude scale, 1 to 10 to 100, 1,000, 10,000. And then we've got this negative sloping line. This is the one we're really going to concentrate on. It's labeled risk on this plot. Um, technically, it's the average annualized life loss threshold, the AALL line, or risk. Uh, this line represents a value of 10 to the minus 3. So any ordered pair on this line is going to equal 10 to the minus 3. For example, 1 times 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 3. 1,000 times 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 3. What this is saying, because it's a negative sloping line, is that as our incremental life loss increases, our acceptable annual probability failure is going to be lower. Um, so this is straight telling us, uh, just at a glance at that chart, that the same design standard is not necessarily going to apply to all dams and levees. Uh, if we have a dam out in the middle of farmer's field that's just there for you know, irrigation purposes and breach of that would not cause any meaningful life loss downstream, then it's going to, you know, it's going to plot way over here on the left side of this chart and we're going to be comfortable with it having a higher annual probability of failure than a dam that, say, sits over top of a big city, where if it failed, it's going to kill thousands of people. Um, we're, we're going to expect that dam to have a safer, more robust design that's going to ultimately lead to a lower annual probability of failure. Um, again, this is not an on-off switch. So you, you see this language on the chart, increasing justification to reduce risk or better understand our risk when we're above the line decreasing justification below the line. So as we get uh, as measured perpendicular anywhere, you know, heading off of this line or lower than this line, we're getting uh, more likely to make some investment or less likely to make some investment in, in reducing those risks. All right, so that's the background. Uh, jump into a couple of case studies uh, from some work we've done uh, out of the Jacksonville district. So this first uh, project is what I'm going to call risk-informed decision-making. Um, the risk uh, was estimated to be high for this project. Uh, risk informed decision to take action on some failure modes, not on others. And then traditional standards based design are going to take over. And those, those, those designs are going to result in, in adequately reducing those risks, meeting those ALR principles. And so we're not going to stray from those standards based design. We're just going to use this to help uh, decide whether we should take action or not. So um, this project. It's Mormon Slough Levy TS-30L. So TS-30L is going to be the name of this segment. It's shown in red here on, on the figure. This project's in Stockton, California. Um, so for some reason, the, the, the powers in charge like to put the gray that's on the furthest east coast on the projects that are located furthest on the west coast. We made somebody angry at some point in time, so that's how they're choosing to punish us. But uh, nonetheless, it's been a real interesting project, um, uh, but, but a few things that are unique about it. Um, first, you can see this, this dividing line. Everything on the right of the line is dense urban development. There is no land that does not have a structure or house or business on it. Everything left of that line is just farmland. And so this becomes that dividing boundary between developed uphill and, and, and our, our, our farmland areas. This uh, kind of, we call it a dry island. It, it's surrounded by water on all sides, except right here where TS-30L is. Uh, this is farmland. It sits slightly below sea level, and it's got a levee around it. It's got a continuously loaded farm levee, levee that's it's not got any federal interest. We, you know, It's just there to keep the farmland dry. And it's got about a 200-year uh, level of protection in terms of its crest elevation. This levee itself has never been loaded. It's a dry levee, so in its entire existence, it's never felt water up against it, so it's never been tested. Uh, what's really unique about it is when it does get loaded, it's not going to get a 10-year load and then a you know 20-year uh, type of event. It's going to go from you know zero to 60 in, in two seconds, right? It's going to go from never loaded to having a 200-year flood load on it um, when these you know, when and if these levees overtop someday. Um, so another unique thing about this project, it's just come out of a feasibility study. Uh, a 
few years back. And so it's got an authorized plan for it. And so they're, you know, the, the district's going in, they're going to go start, start implementing this plan. And now we've got this risk informed design guidance. So our cadre was asked to come in and help use that risk informed approach to make sure we're, you know, making a wise federal investment out here and following our own guidance and letting, letting risk do what it's supposed to and inform our design. Feasibility identified two failure modes. They're not, they're not failure modes that, that, that we would write down today. Uh, they're more generic. So the first one is under seepage. And there's a, a design criteria that was locally used to decide whether this, this, this failure mode was actionable or not. And that is that under a top of levy loading condition, the uh, downstream exit gradient across the blanket has to be less than 0.5. It's kind of an on-off switch. If we're at 0 0.4, we're good. We're at 0 0.6, we're bad. And so um, using this type of analysis and some seepage analysis, the, the, the team went through and did their best and, and, and decided where we're going to put in cutoff wall or not put in cutoff wall. Feasibility study is not real specific with the depth of the wall, exactly what layer they're treating, um, what type of wall going in. So there's a, there's a lot of decisions to still be made where, where risk could come in and really help inform those. Uh, the other failure mode that was uh, received attention in the feasibility study for this segment is wave overwash. Um, so if this area were to flood, we would have a very large open body of water, lots of wind fetch over a mile. So if you put wind on top of that water, certainly we can imagine a case where we could generate waves. Those waves could then hit the embankment, overwash the top. That overwash starts to cause erosion on the crest and the backside of the levee slope and can take it to failure. And so both of these are authorized to make repairs to that levee under the, the plan, authorized plan. The other unique thing here is sea level rise. So this is this is another example I was asked to present just because we're, we're going to explore how sea level rise is going to play into our risk-informed decision-making approach. Um, so what we have here on the right stage frequency curve, we have annual exceedance probability and then river elevation. And the, the gray line is our best estimate up through a 500 year event for loading on this levee. So the first thing that jumps out is this guidance that was used by the district was a top of levee load uh, applied, applied to the levee and then we're gonna check those downstream gradients. But when we look at it from a system approach, elevations of all other levees in this system are sitting at about 15, some even lower. Um, TS-30L is sitting up at 17. So to get a top of levee load, we would have already overtopped the entire system by two feet. So our levee area is flooded. You know, at that point, there are no incremental consequences. We, we put miles of two feet of overtopping into the system. Um, so it was really a, an erroneous load case to even start with, but that is their design standard. So they, they didn't do anything wrong, but when we look at it from a, a risk-based approach, we find out that that load case can't even occur. So we're gonna talk about real load cases and how those are going to apply. The other thing here is this sea level rise component. So first clear up one concept, we did not uh, discuss climate change on this project. So climate change would imply changes to the hydrologic loadings that could occur, more extreme droughts, more extreme rainfall, that, you know, that could change, certainly change your stage frequency curve. Uh, we didn't look at that. We don't have that information available. I, I think the jury is still out on how that's going to play in. We did have estimates for sea level rise, though. The San Joaquin River um, ties into the Pacific Ocean, not too far from where TS-30L is. That area is tidally influenced. It goes up and down every day about four feet in this area. So if we have a, a, a rise in our base sea level, we're going to have a rise effectively in our tailwater for those riverine flows that are coming from the mountains. And what we see is that shifts everything up. So what at one point would have been a 10 year event at the end of the planning horizon with it, you know, considering sea level rise becomes maybe a, a two or three year event. Um, an example, a hundred year event becomes more like a 10 year event. So in some areas we're seeing about an order of magnitude shift in our frequency of loading. So that's gonna play into our, our risk informed design approach as well. When we went through this, uh, the, the feasibility study said under seepage, Okay, we turned that into backward erosion piping through the foundation. So when we looked at our uh, geology geometry here, we see a, a clay blanket and, and mostly clay levee. 
and then a clear blanket aquifer type condition. We have clay sitting on top of sand. That sand over on the land side, there's a farmer's ditch in that, that what we call the dry island. So when that area gets flooded, we're gonna have a direct entrance of hydraulic load into our sand. It's gonna charge up that aquifer and give us a pretty high gradients on that downstream side. Uh, the most likely case we looked at, there's several defects in that blanket. We've got swimming pools that sit within you know, 20, 30 feet of the levee toe. And we've also got uh, some transmission, power transmission towers that have foundations that are gonna cut into that clay blanket. Those are gonna be our most likely locations to get some of that seepage out into the surface. Um, put our event tree in here. I'm not gonna run through this for the sake of time. I'm not trying to defend these numbers to you, just trying to get to the result. Uh, what we see is dense urban development behind it. And so as expected, we got pretty high life loss um, our, our land side elevations right up behind the levee are minus two, they're below sea level. Um, looking at 500 year load of about 12, so you're putting about 14 feet of water if you were to breach into that levee area. So you can imagine life loss is going get, to get pretty high pretty quick. Um, we don't see this as having a very high probability of failure. Our best estimate was about one in 10,000. That's because of the thickness of the blanket. We would have to start bringing these sand materials eight, 10 feet to the surface, that takes a lot of energy to drive those up and sustain that movement. Um, we also have the probability of even getting to these types of loads, um, 200 to 500 year type events. So we, we end up fairly low on the APF side, but pretty high on the life loss side. And we end up with a, a best estimate for risk for this particular failure mode that's gonna be above that risk guideline. Um, so how does sea level rise come into this? When we take sea level rise, the, the frequency of these loading events are gonna go up half order magnitude to order magnitude, depending on where we're at on that stage frequency curve. And what that does is that, that kicks our risk up um, even further. And so we were above guidelines when we consider sea level rise at the end of our planning horizon, we're gonna be even further out. So we've got risk above the guideline, it's going to increase with time, and this is gonna help the risk-informed decision to go in and take action against this failure mode. And so we agreed that, that backward erosion piping uh, could, could warrant action. We've got an authorized plan to put in a cutoff wall. And so we're going to use this to help defend what layer we're going to treat and the decision to take action. But we're going to fall back to a standards-based design because we've got clay that, that's, again, underneath the sand. We cut that off. We're going to kill almost all of our gradients. But there's no need, to, you know, once we put that cutoff wall in, we're going to meet all of these factors of safety um, and there's not going to be a need to change from that standards-based design. So it's really a decision to take action against this failure mode that was supported by the risk assessment. And the risk assessment helped identify exactly what layer we're targeting uh, and where on this levee we're going to do that. So this is with the cutoff wall in place. Again, now our failure mode now has to either go through some defect in the wall, which hopefully we're good enough at constructing cutoff wall to minimize that risk. Um, Post-implementation evaluation would confirm that. Uh, or we're going to have to pipe through these clays around the end of our wall. Again, we killed the gradient. Once we did that, we see a very low probability of initiation and continuation. And those failure modes, uh, although they're going to maintain their, their, their high life loss estimates, they're going to drop down to the bottom of the chart. All right, so the other failure mode that was being considered here was this wave action, the road's slope. So we're looking at an overwash failure mode. So Overwash we've typically looked at when we've got armoring on the front side of the levee or the dam. So a lot of times you'll have big riprap that goes all the way up the, the water side damming surface and it's protected. Um, or you'll have soil cement or concrete or something. And, and then, then you start looking at overwash going over the back because that becomes your most vulnerable failure mode. Uh, this particular levee has no erosion protection on it on any side. And so actually, when we went through it from a failure mode perspective, we saw wave action actually acting on the slope of that levee being the more likely uh, load case. And so we, we actually looked at overwash and basically screened it and said wave action on that front face is going to be a higher risk because that's going to take the, the brunt of the force. And so we focused on that. Now, uh, when we started going through this effort, they had a design standard, 200-year flood, 75-year, one-hour wind, has to have an overwash rate less than 0.1 cubic feet per second per foot. And again, it was an on-off switch, right? You take that design standard, you apply it to the levee. If you have a higher overwash rate, we should fix it. If we have a lower overwash rate, we're going to say it's okay. Uh, but what he didn't do was explore the, the probability of those coincident loadings. 
So we took the, uh, looked at a 200-year flood. Um, it's got a duration of about 21 days at its peak before it starts receding back down. As it recedes, we're getting wider and wider levee, um, and that failure mode is going to start diminishing. So we're going to really say this thing peaked at about a 200-year flood. Um, and then we got a 75-year wind, um, and that wind, they, they used a one-hour wind. Uh, regardless of whether you could fail it in an hour, that, that's what they did. So they looked at a one hour win. So if we just look at the duration of the flood and then the coincident probability of that wind occurring during the flood, we're already at four times 10 to the minus six without even getting into whether uh, this type of event would fail the levee. So we're already, we're already kissing the bottom of the FN plot really at this point. Uh, so first question would be, are they really independent events? Um, a flood that loads the San Joaquin River that's gonna cause this type of flooding uh, it's not going to be a direct rainfall event. It's going to be a rainfall that occurs up in the Sierras. That's going to have to get into the creeks. That's going to get into the dams. It's going to uh, activate those spillways. It's going to come downstream. And this flood's going to arrive days, probably even more like weeks, behind the actual uh, hydrologic event that caused it. Uh, we also looked at wind and floods in this area, and, and we don't see them as being coincident events. So we had treated them as independent events. When we treat them as independent, we're starting out at a very, very low uh, annual probability of just those two events occurring simultaneously. Where do we end up with all of this? Um, these were our failure modes, existing condition, existing condition with sea level rise. So if you look at all of these, they're the exact same, except everything bumps up about a half order of magnitude for the with sea level rise case. Um, 17, that was that critical case for backward erosion piping when we had a defect in the levee. Um, we looked at PFM 18, that's the exact same failure mode except rather than being something we would spot treat where we could just go say, do some work around the transmission tower or do some work in front of that swimming pool. We looked at actually having to have blowout of that blanket. Um, having to, to do that, you, you, you introduce another node in the event tree, another slightly unlikely node, which is gonna drive that down. But it shows that you're hovering on that guideline. So this kind of helped inform the decision. Look, if we're gonna fix it anywhere, let's fix it everywhere. Uh, we had PFM 22, which was a slope stability failure. It by itself, if that was the only failure mode we looked at, we probably wouldn't touch it. But if we're going to go out there and put it in a cutoff wall, if we're going to go out there and degrade the levee to do this work, uh, we can get this failure mode for almost free just by reshaping the levee, flattening it out, and, and again, going with a standards-based design and just chasing you know realistic um, slope stability factors of safety, and we can attack all of these Targeting 17, 18, we get 22 for almost free. And then those residual risks are going to fall down and be about where 07 is, that, that wave impact already sits. So making this investment and treating PFM 07 uh, didn't seem to make sense from a risk-informed approach because we're going to drive that failure mode even lower. Uh, but what did we get for it? Um, our total risk is still going to be dominated by that, that wave action of PFM 17 and 18 after we put in the cutoff wall. Um, so that's risk-informed decision, um, standards-based design on everything we did there. We just used that to help justify exactly what failure modes we were treating and you know, where we needed to treat them. Um, so moving on to a new example, this is going to be risk-informed design during PET. So this is a new project. We looked at the stand design standards that were being used. In this case, we judged them to be too conservative, made recommendations to back off of them and said, don't make sense. Um, again, I'm going to try and give you just enough project information. I'm not trying to sell the results to you, just trying to give an example of, of how this worked out. Uh, this particular project is called EAA, Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. It's pump storage. So it sits south of Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee is the heart of Florida. So all of the rainfall runoff from Disney World down to Lake Okeechobee is going to end up in this lake. We got a lot of problems with water quality. We've got really good capacity to bring water in and little pea shooters to put water out. Part of the, the mitigation for water quality and better management of Lake Okeechobee is to get some areas to park some water for a little bit. And to do that, we're building some new dams uh, all around the southern part of this lake. Um, they're pump storage, so they're off-river. They only get water in them from direct rainfall or because we flipped a switch and put water in them. So they're a little bit unique in that perspective. 
Uh, so this was feasibility level design. We just have a couple of cross sections uh, to go through, but we were still able to do potential failure mode analysis, look at consequences, and, and make some, some risk informed decisions on it. Um, so again, water is going to be delivered here through two canals. E2 reservoir is going to sit here. Uh, I think the first takeaway is this is not in a densely developed area. We've got sugarcane as far as the eye can see to the north, and we've got preservation land, wetlands, as far as the eye can see to the south. Um, water is released, just how this works. Water will be uh, pumped up into the reservoir. It's held, and it goes into what uh, we call an STA, a stormwater treatment area. It's a very shallow pond, just two, three feet deep. It's full of emergent vegetation. That, that vegetation, that water is going to trickle through there, and you're going to pull some of the phosphates and some of the dirty stuff out of that water. It's going to go back into the canal and eventually be delivered to the Everglades as a cleaner water that's been scrubbed to some of the nasty stuff that, that they don't want enter, entering uh, Everglades National Park. So again, I'm just going to run through a quick failure mode, I'm not trying to sell it to you, but the uh, this is the preliminary cross-section that they had. Uh, they've got select fill. It looks like a core. Keep in mind, this is in South Florida. We don't have a big uh, borrow source where we can go get a bunch of clay and build a nice core that just don't exist. We've got sand. We've got limestone. The limestone, this would be processed limestone. This stuff will cement up a little bit, get, get a lot of rock flour in it. So you'll get a pretty, pretty low permeability through it. Cut off wall to cut off some of the uh, buggy limestones that exist underneath it, and then a downstream filter. And then there's a, there's a distribution canal around the outside that would also have an inverted filter right on the face. So we can draw a conceivable failure path that can bypass all of these filters, can work underneath, these things aren't, aren't connected. So when we walk through this, uh, we see there being some fairly low probability of backward erosion piping. We're estimating around 10 to the minus five. Uh, very low life loss, just because this thing's sitting out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the risk driving load case that we were looking at is what we're gonna call normal st full storage level. That's the normal level that we would pump this thing up to in any given year. Um, just a note here, BEP, known potential failure mode that has plagued Florida. So we had Martin County Reservoir, it failed from BEP. Herbert Hoover Dyke almost failed. It actually had a reverse failure into it from BEP. Ten Mile Creek almost failed. Levy 40 almost failed from BEP. So it's a known problem. It's real, and we've dealt with it. We spent a lot of money mitigating it on some of our projects. So it's certainly one we're going to hone in on very quickly on anything we're there. We get this number. Uh, certainly we had some comments and some recommendations to do this a little bit better. But just where it's set is its baseline risk. Everybody's comfortable with that. It's, it's well below guidelines. Uh, we're, we're really we're, we're, we're comfortable with where that, that, that failure mode sits, going with our traditional design standard approach. Counter to that, they've also got an overwash failure mode. This is very similar to what we saw on, on the previous project. The difference is we have soil cement on the, on the, on the face and on the crest. So that soil cement is going to protect that direct wave attack. It's also going to make that wave want to run up and over the crest and down the backside. So again, off river, we don't have a, a runaway uh, drainage that's just going to come into here and, and fill this dam up. It's either direct rainfall or we pumped it in. Um, certainly we can over pump uh, the capacities here versus spillway capacity. We ruled all that out. Um, so, so really we're, we're kind of capped at this normal full storage level unless we get like a PMP on top probable maximum precipitation directly on top of this reservoir. Uh, and so what we see here is that we end up with almost half the reservoir embankment height that existing is freeboard to protect against wave overwash. Along with that, they've also included a concrete wave wall on top. Uh, this embankment, if you go back to the aerial, it's miles and miles and miles in diameter. So this is not, these are not little bits of earthwork that, that we're putting in here. Uh, design criteria again, overwash rate not to exceed 0.1 cubic feet per second per foot of dam, given a coincident 1 in 100 uh, annual exceedance probability wind event at the same time as the peak of the probable maximum flood, which because we're off reservoir means the peak of the probable maximum precipitation event. So the PMP centering directly over the reservoir. Um, so we have done some overwash testing. The sponsor did some testing at the site. Here you can see some processed limestone fill. This is what's going to build that select fill core. Um, they ran a overwash test of 0.23 CFS and then 0.1 CFS. And they ran them for eight hours. Keep in mind that criteria above was for a one-hour wind. 
one hour probability of exceeding the wind event. We take that overwash rate and we run it on this embankment for eight hours. And it basically self armored. Uh, this is truly a worst case. There's no grass, there's no vegetation, there's no erosion. We're not seeing, we're seeing some damage, but we're not seeing anything near failure. We also have done overwash tests to Colorado State University. We actually sent them some soil from EAA. Um, CSU found that overwash rate wasn't nearly as meaningful as cumulative overwash volume, meaning that low overwash rates for a long period of time could be just as damaging as high overwash rates for a short period of time. They came up with, a, just from several different project sites we had sent, that 6,000 um, cumulative uh, cubic feet of water going over the dam represented failure. Failure in this case was um, grass starting to gully, losing the grass, starting to actually get some erosion channels developing. You see some low nails on, on this graphic. Don't be misled by these. These are unique situations. Um, test six came from EAA. Test six had no grass, no sod cover. It would just loose dirt to put in the tray. Um, what they actually found in the other tests that they ran for EAA is that um, test eight failed because the sod failed to take root. So when they started going through wet dry cycles and, and watering this material, it cemented up. It, it's, it's this processed limestone fill. And so, yeah, the grass washed off almost immediately and they called it failure. It's because they didn't get any root penetration into it because there was no topsoil. Uh, the real test where they really did it the way we would build it is seven. And it showed that stuff was incredibly resilient against, against overwash. So the tests are conclusive out there at EAA that overwash, you know, it, a little bit of overwash is not going to fail this, this embankment. Taking those overwash rates, uh, again, we had a one hour wind that they were talking about. So we talked about wind duration and overwash volumes. What we found, if you take that 0.1 cubic feet per second per foot, compared that back to Colorado State University's 6,000 cubic feet of water, where they saw that cumulative volume resulting in failure instead of just a random overwash rate, you were talking about 16 hours of, of continued overwash, 16 hours of wind continuing to blow in the exact same direction, 100-year wind. So that means that means hurricanes in Florida. So um, we'll talk about that next. So. Um, we have done some, some work on that as well. We did this for Herbert Hoover Dyke. Uh, certainly this applies down to that other reservoir. Um, and we looked at the probability of having wind speeds being sustained. So what we see counterclockwise rotating hurricane, these, these storms move. They're wrapping around an eye wall. So as that center of circulation moves, the direction of wind changes. So, Having water blow, you know, having wind blow in one direction for 16 hours at a 100-year event, what's the probability of that? Well, we, what we see is that as we get to higher, uh, higher wind velocities, so we've got uh, the five-year, 10-year, 25-year, all the way up to a 500-year wind, what we see is the probability of having that sustained duration is reducing, the exceeded probability is going down for those higher winds. That's because those are tighter storms, tighter rotating eye walls. Uh, big energy storms tend to move faster and not stall. So there's a bunch of reasons for it. So um, the probability of, of having a, a five-year wind last five hours is pretty close to one. The probability of having a 500-year wind last five hours is, is better than, than, than one in a thousand. So um, again, wind duration is going to matter. So not to dwell on the event tree too much, but when we look at the probability of having the reservoir actually full, so normal full storage level, that's the level that we would pump it up to as a maximum. But what we found out is when they've modeled this system, that's only going to happen on extremely wet years. So the probability of it even existing at normal full storage level is starting out at about 10 to the minus 3. The probability of having a PMP event center on the reservoir, we, we took it at 1 in 10,000. It's probably even less than that. Probability of a PMP in that general area is 10,000. Having it center on that reservoir is going to be even less, but we took it at one in 10,000. And the probability of having that, uh, that that wind speed just be maintained for eight hours, 100 year wind, um, you, you are already at 10 to the minus three. So we're starting again. We, we start multiplying those out. We're going to we're going to fall off the bottom of the chart real quick. Uh, the other thing is consequences. Normal full storage level, normal day, we could have agriculture workers in the field. There's a quarry not too far north of this where we'd have humans. There's a sugar processing plant where we have humans. 
other than that, there's nobody around. There's a roadway. Breach water doesn't get up over it. It's elevated quite a bit above these farmlands. EMP type of event is going to be four, almost five feet of water in 72 hours. Um, so if we center a PMP on this reservoir, everything's already flooded with feet of water. So breach at that point almost has no incremental consequences anyway. We've already done all of our damage just from the breach. So when we look at consequences, when we start talking about PMP type of events, those just in themselves are never going to drive risk when direct rainfall had to be what loaded our reservoir. So uh, we've got an event with no consequences. And when we start adding up all of these, the, these factors on the event tree, we're getting a very low probability of failure and even or a very low probability of just coincident events occurring. And then for low probability of failure, on top of that, we're falling off the bottom of the chart. So we're going to build this reservoir and we're going to be comfortable with BEP, which is plagued reservoirs across South Florida, uh, sitting at about 10 to the minus five below life loss. And we're going to spend all this extra money to overbuild the embankment by double and put a flood wall on top to chase this one failure mode that's got no incremental consequences off the bottom of the chart. It doesn't make any sense to suggest a significant overinvestment in, in this failure mode when total risk is always going to be dominated right here. Um, so our recommendation, um, they, they needed to back off that design standard. So it is a design standard. It's accepted design standard that they've used to design other reservoirs in Florida. We've built some to that design standard already. When we look at it from a risk-informed design perspective, we recommended backing off of that. We presented this case uh, to the district and, and the sponsor. They've agreed, and they've actually backed off of this. Um, they dropped that reservoir a couple of feet. They got rid of the flood wall. Um, that's going to bring that failure mode up a little bit. We're still going to stay conservative with it because there is some uncertainty there. But I'll, I'll tell you that the number I got from the, the, the lead engineer on this is making some of the changes that we recommended has, has resulted in about $70 million in cost savings. Figure, uh, they complained about the cost of the risk assessment, but the results have saved them about $70 million. So I think we did okay there. Um, all right, so one more, we'll run through this real quick, so I'm sure I'm out of time. Collier County uh, Coastal uh, Storm Risk Management Study. So this is, again, South Florida. This is a feasibility study. Um, this was at the end of its three by three by three cycle, uh, seeking authority for this project. Uh, this project is designed to protect against storm surge. Uh, here we're showing Hurricane Irma. Hurricane Irma came and skirted the coast. It actually went ashore right here where this project is gonna go. So it was a great co -study, uh, case study for this area. Um, what they've proposed and shown in yellow is flood wall, uh, with the red being a dune structure that connects it to form a, a system. Again, area two, flood wall, dune structure, and then area three is just flood wall. So these will work together as a system to exclude the 200 year flood uh, from coming inland and flooding these densely developed areas. All right, so flood wall, robust designs, top elevation, uh, elevation 14 feet, that's 200 year um, level of protection. Some of them are T-wall or I-wall, some of them are uh, T-wall. Pile founded, they include cutoff wall underneath them, heavily reinforced concrete, splash pads on the back to protect against overwash. Um, these were designed using typical design standards for 200 year storm loading gave them to the structural engineers and the geotech engineers, and they said, hey, we put a 200-year load on here. This is what we need to do. Uh, the dune structure, they gave it to another group. They gave it to the coastal, the coastal folks, and they ran Beach FX, and they designed a dune structure to protect against the 200-year storm. In fact, they didn't actually design it to protect against the 200-year storm. Beach FX is going to run a Monte Carlo simulation of just different storm events that come to the area, and it's going to tell you, your renourishment cycle for how often you're not going to need to add sand because it is a sacrificial element. It's it's not a levy. Um, they also set the crest at elevation 14. So it was just a different design group. One, one, one group designed flood walls. They're used to designing flood walls. One group designed a dune. They're used to designing dunes. They stuck them together to form a system. Um, the problem is they're, they're puzzle pieces that aren't part of the same puzzle. Is my best way to describe it. So you got a sand dune it's at elevation 14 that faces open water. So you're gonna have the infinite fetch of the Gulf of Mexico 
blowing up onto this dune, putting waves over it, and it would physically have wave overtopping occurring during the 200 storm year storm. Not, not waves breaking on the slope and running up over the top, but physically cresting and breaking over the back of the dune structure. And the dune is just made of sand. So in a 200 year event, uh, when we look at it from a potential failure mode analysis, it is, uh, it's got a system response probability of one. It's guaranteed to fail. Meanwhile, that's connecting to flood walls that are running inland, which are massive, robust, well-designed structures. So um, what do we see uh, when we compare those two together from a potential failure mode and a risk analysis standpoint? The dune up here is, is approaching a system probability at the 200-year event, whereas the wall with a splash pad and a cutoff wall founded on piles, it's going to be much, much more robust and much safer design. But as a system, these two don't go together. Even though the dune was designed appropriately, the wall was designed appropriately, uh, using their typical design standards, sticking them together is the same system as where they don't, they don't go together. And it shows a gross overinvestment in the flood wall uh, because your risk is going to be dominated by the dune. It's never going to get any better than this without changing it and designing it as an actual levy. Um, this project also had an element of risk transfer. So that was risk-informed call that risk-informed design um, because they were using their typical design standards where our, our recommendation was they do not go together and they need to reevaluate the project. Um, the flood wall alignment also had an element of risk transfer. Um, so again, this is going to play in our risk-informed decision-making process. These, these, these walls had uh, on the order of 75 roadway closures. And in some areas, when they close those gates, you block all points of egress from certain neighborhoods or limit it down to just a single point for large, large, dense populations. Um, similarly, and these people would be trapped on the flood side. Similarly, there was areas where people could be trapped on the protective side, but they, they can't get in or out uh, once the gates are closed. So something happens during the storm or after the storm or a medical emergency that the gates are closed, you're locked in. So we saw there was a, we considered a big element of risk transfer, um, increasing the risk of population A for the sake of reducing risk for population B. Um, it just seems like a bad idea. So we made a lot of recommendations on this project. We actually don't know where that ends up. That's fairly new. Um, planning team didn't particularly like hearing it, um, but from a risk-informed design perspective, we think there's a lot of issues with that particular project. So throwing that out as another quick example. Um, so in summary, uh, we talked about standards-based design, how those are gonna play into our risk-informed decision-making process. Uh, decisions to take action, not take action, as low as reasonably practicable. Uh, this, this concept of starting at the design standards, but then using risk to inform how low is low enough, where, what should we take action on or what not. And then moving all the way to a risk-informed design approach where we're deciding to um, straight ignore or completely adjust from some design standard uh, because the risk says it doesn't make sense.